Folks, you're probably wondering why your teachers brought you here this morning. If you've ever walked down the hallway, going down to the gymnasium, on the right, there are two plaques. And those plaques recognize lifetime achievement of North Penn High School graduates. And as you look at them, uh, you may have read them, you may not have read them. If you continue down the hallway, there's a sports hall of fame that goes down across from uh, Doc Ryan's office and Linda Law's office. And that has a whole lot of information on sports teams. But on this other hallway, the one going straight out of the auditorium and down, we've started that three years ago. We began the idea that we were going to recognize North Penn High School graduates who have gone on with their lives and they've contributed to the community, they've done something admirable, they've got a recognizable career path, and realizing that it all began right here in North Penn High School. So this year's nominee is Dr. Steve Samkuti. Dr. Samkuti graduated from this high school in 1978. He'll talk to you about the journey that he's taken, but one of the things that you're going to hear as you listen to him is that it was not just about going to college and getting a bachelor's degree and ending things there. He continued on as a lifelong learner. And that's the lesson that I think I want everyone to hear today. You'll hear the path that he took and you'll hear about what he's doing as a doctor in today's world, affiliated with Abington Hospital. If you ever pick up Philadelphia Magazine, you'll read, be able to read about him in there in the, in the part about the doctor's sections usually. So here's a student who once sat in the same classrooms that you're sitting in. I won't say he had some of the same teachers, although he may have had a few. And in fact, back in the day when we still had homeroom, he was in my homeroom when I was a young teacher and he was a student. So there is a connection there. I, that's how I, I remember Dr. Sam Cootie, and I started reading about him and saying, wow, here's a North Penn student who's gone on and really made a name for himself in his career. So I'll let, you, let him talk to you about that. Here's Dr. Steve Sam Cootie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Well, I am deeply honored to be here and stand in front of you all. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the journey that Mr. Hines is alluding to. I was here and graduated in 1978 and had, what, 920 or 30 kids in our class. And I was in this pointy-headed geek section of uh, uh, advanced placement kids, and that allowed me to graduate with uh, sophomore standing when I went to college and ended up being able to finish college in three years. And I studied German here and I was able to become a German literature major at Lehigh University without really having to take any of the prerequisites. So I was able to have a, a double major in biology and German. And I can tell you that um, I've authored a couple of books and my English teachers here inspired me to write and gave me the foundation of a fabulous uh, vocabulary and having to study incredibly. It was, it was a, an exciting time. It was at the end of the Vietnam War and there was a lot of uh, craziness going on in the hallways here. There was a smoking lounge, there was a smoking courtyard, you could occasionally smell marijuana every now and then. It was, it was, uh, there was a lot of bullying that would happen. And I, would, I was in the cafeteria one day and I was telling uh, some folks earlier that um, they were trying to steal my lunch or what have you and, and uh, they were, telling me, hey, professor, you know, why don't you uh, come with me and let's uh, go outside and smoke some dope and what have you. And I said, you know, uh, marijuana fractures your chromosomes because there was this report in the literature or I remember it was Time magazine or whatever that marijuana could possibly do that. So after that, the, these guys would come up to me and say, oh, professor, let's go fracture some chromosomes together. So it was kind of a, a funny uh, <clears throat> time. But I can tell you that if you are committed to the educational process, North Penn High School will give you that firm foundation to succeed. And the teachers here 
who have dedicated their lives to educate you were absolutely fabulous and fantastic folks. I just can't say enough about the fond memories that I have of my teachers here. And that led me to a lifelong career now in reproductive endocrinology because it was in 1978 where the first baby was born through in vitro fertilization. And it was in my social science class that one of the teachers made a comment about, hey, did you hear about the test tube baby? And I said, what, test tube baby? And kind of sparked my interest and that led to me becoming a biology and uh, uh, science major at Lehigh University. Following that, uh, and I did research there in uh, reproductive medicine and ended up spending time at Baylor College of Medicine through my summers doing research down there. And then I got a PhD at Duke University in the Department of Reproductive Biology and Pharmacology and we were working on studying how uh, to develop a contraceptive for men and looking at some of the toxic effects of environmental chemicals on the reproductive system. And then I felt a calling for, as the assisted reproductive technologies were becoming more and more accepted, that um, I went to medical school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and finished that in three years instead of four years because of the uh, extra credit that I had in my PhD. And then that was followed by a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Duke University from 1989 to 93. And then back to the University of North Carolina to do a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology. So I finally finished my schooling officially in 1995. So mom and dad were very happy to stop sending me a couple hundred bucks every month to keep me alive and have food. But it was a, a journey that I would never um, uh, trade for anything else because being a student and being a learner is something that is uh, so, so uh, cerebrally stimulating, if you will. So I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, insight as to what is it that uh, what is it that this branch of medicine offers? And this was the first report in, in uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the Lancet, which was a medical journal that was heralding the success of the first test tube baby. And the reason that somebody would want to have in vitro fertilization, remember in vitro is the Latin word for in a glass dish. It sounds really erudite, but it's just in a glass dish. So, when people were not able to have children, there were reasons, and sometimes it's because of uh, a problem with the male, sometimes with the woman, combination of factors, but one of the most common reasons was your fallopian tubes were blocked, and that was because of a previous infection, it could be a sexually transmitted disease, it could have been through previous surgery, a ruptured appendix, or um, endometriosis. There's all types of pathologies that could block your fallopian tubes. And you, as you guys know, sperm and eggs have to meet at the end of the fallopian tube and then the embryo beds down in the hotel room, the uterus, right? So with these blocked tubes, the only way you could try to unblock them was to do surgery. Well, surgery isn't very good to unblock tubes. So Dr. Steptoe and Dr. Edwards in Bourne Hall in England came up with the concept of We'll take the eggs, put them in a dish, take the darts and put them in a dish and create an embryo and transfer it back into the uterus so you bypass the blocked fallopian tubes. What an incredible concept. So as a result, the first baby was born in 1978, uh, Louise Brown. And Louise Brown has now herself become a mother. And since then, now, if you remember, in 2010, Dr. Edwards was awarded the Nobel Prize for his developments in the area of assisted reproductive technology and inventing in vitro fertilization. He's standing next to Louise Brown with her baby there as well. This has now resulted, this technology, with over five million children born across the world as of July of 2013. So you can see that one man's concept or two men's concept resulted in people who would never have been able to have their own biological children now are successful parents. So 
you guys are old enough to see this, right? This is the sperm around the egg, and <clears throat> the process of fertilization results in now the embryo being created, and you have a two cell, which then develops onto the three and four cell and five and six cell stage. So when our patients go through in vitro fertilization, you have uh, about a three to five day process of watching the embryos grow in a dish. And by the fifth day, you have what is called a blastocyst embryo. In the blastocyst embryo, you can see this mass of cells right here is actually what is going to turn into the fetus. So these are uh, opportunities for uh, having a, a, a successful pregnancy by transferring embryos. Now, there are certain situations where there's not enough sperm to fertilize the egg. Now, does everybody know how many sperm it takes to fertilize an egg? Everybody says one, but in reality, if you would put one sperm next to an egg, it ain't going to fertilize, okay? Because it turns out that the outer shell of the egg here, which is the zona pellucida, that has to get digested or chewed up. So the thousands and thousands of sperm around the eggs, around the egg is necessary to release enzymes to digest the outer shell of the egg for that one lucky sperm to get in there. So there are situations in men who've had chemotherapy or radiation or have genetic diseases or trauma, and they don't have those requisite numbers of sperm. So along in 1991, a very uh, uh, erudite fellow at uh, Cornell University, Dr. Palermo, came up with the concept of ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where he took a very fine pipette, and you can see the sperm is right here, and you can literally pole vault the sperm directly into the egg, thereby bypassing the outer shell that you wouldn't have the normal requisite number of sperm to penetrate it with. This revolutionized the way we treated men with low sperm counts, where in the past we'd say, well, go use donor sperm or go adopt or, or stop trying. So this also now is a, a standard and routine part of assisted reproductive technology laboratories. There's some very exciting newer advances that I thought you might be interested in hearing about. And my partner, uh, Larry Barmat, who uh, trained up at Cornell University, developed something called autologous, which means your own, endometrial, which are the cells in the uterus, co-culture. And this is a technique where the embryos are, normally they're grown in some Kool-Aid, okay, some salt water and pyruvate and glucose and, um, uh, metabolites that are, or, or uh, proteins that are necessary for the embryo to grow, but in all honesty, we really don't know what to sprinkle into the dish to make embryos grow. So he came up with a concept, well, mom knows best. And if you take cells from inside the uterus and put them in vitro, and then put the embryos on top of mom's cells, now from day zero until they go back into mom, you have the advantages of mom's cells delivering all the growth factors and nutrients and vitamins and goodies to make the embryos grow. So autologous endometrial co-culture is something that's only done in three places in the world, okay? At Cornell University, and there's a fellow, fellow in Valencia, Spain that does it, and at little old Abington Hospital. <clears throat> now, there's a couple other things I'll touch on, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and egg freezing. So, there are reasons why people don't have success when they're trying to get pregnant. And that can be because of chromosomal problems or because the uterus may not be a receptive hotel room or because the culture conditions in the laboratory aren't really uh, optimal. So as I mentioned, this co-culturing technique, again, revolutionized folks who've had multiple failed attempts at getting pregnant through IVF or they have poor embryo quality. We have people coming to us from all over the planet for this type of technology. <clears throat> and here's just a picture showing the, the endometrial cells growing here with the embryos growing on the bed of these uh, uh, endometrial cells. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. I'm sure many of you 
have friends or relatives or acquaintances or have seen people on the street with genetic problems and genetic abnormalities and morphological abnormalities. And now with the sequencing of the Human Genome Project, we have been able to identify the address of a lot of the different mutations for various diseases. And using that technology now, you can do a biopsy of an embryo, and the Philadelphia Inquirer did an interview with us because we were the first program in the state of Pennsylvania to offer this type of um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and the title of the article is The Bad Gene Stops Here, because by using this technique, you will prevent the transmission of disease. And so what happens here is you have your eight cell embryo on the third day, and now our embryologists use a laser and drill a hole into the zone of pellucidity here and can remove one cell from the embryo. And there's that cell being removed. And this large pipette here is called a holding pipette to be able to keep the embryo from moving. And that single cell now is available for genetic analysis. So imagine that distraught parents or patients come to you saying, you know, we have a child affected with cystic fibrosis, a devastating lung disease. Most of the time the kids are dead by the age of 15. Or Huntington's chorea, or Marfan syndrome, or there's a list of 200 to 300 now of these single gene disorders where you can take that single cell and find out whether it's affected with that particular disorder. This is just showing you that we can now take the cells out of the blastocyst embryo as well, which is a recent development. So what happens is that you can now use microarray analysis using molecular biology techniques and be able to determine if you have 10 embryos in a dish, that numbers two and six and nine are affected with the uh, particular disease and four, seven, and 10, or what have you, are unaffected or safe to transfer, and thereby you are going to prevent that transmission of the disease. Here's just a partial list of diseases that you can uh, avoid the, uh, the uh, baby from uh, contracting. I'll tell you a story about a, a uh, couple who came to us who both were physicians, very smart people, were being treated downtown at a very large university who um, nickname is the Quakers, but I won't say what their name is, okay? And they were, they had an affected child with congenital deafness. And they were distraught that this child was deaf. They ended up having a second pregnancy. And at that pregnancy, they did an amniocentesis which is taking cells from the fluid around the baby around 15 weeks into the pregnancy, and they determined that this was another affected child with congenital deafness. Because it turns out they did some homework and there's a genetic marker for this, and it's called Connexin 26. They chose to terminate that pregnancy because they said, we don't want to have two deaf children. They ended up coming to us and we did genetic analysis of the embryos when they went through IVF and were able to find unaffected embryos and they have a healthy child without congenital deafness. And this is a incredibly powerful technique. You can also imagine that it is incredibly ethically a slippery slope because there are people potentially sitting in this auditorium, they may not be here because you were selected out because your prospective parents didn't want to pass on a particular disorder. And again, with the Human Genome Project now, you have the ability to determine whether an embryo carries the gene for Alzheimer's or for colon cancer. Now, I can tell you that people with colon cancer now live on to their 70s, 80s and do just fine. Yet, when the parent or prospective parent is, is faced with the possibility of 
geez, I can select out which embryos are not gonna have Alzheimer's and, and not gonna carry the gene for colon or breast cancer, or what have you, you can see that you have potentially very uh, ethically slippery slopes. Uh, Woody Guthrie is a fellow who has children with Huntington's disease, and Arlo Guthrie, and these are guys from the 1960s that you wouldn't remember, uh, uh, folk singers and poets and what have you. And when they found, when he found out that that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis exists and that you could prevent the transmission of Huntington's disease, which is a universally fatal disease that everybody dies in their 50s and 60s, yet now you can determine an embryo ahead of time whether it's effective or not. His answer at a Huntington's conference was, you know what, I choose to live. So he's very happy that this technology wasn't around, that he would have been selected uh, out of the uh, gene pool, if you will. And you can see here, there's sickle cell, uh, myotonic dystrophy. I had two patients yesterday in my office with myotonic dystrophy, Gaucher's disease, and so on and so on. So the future that I've alluded to in, in this part of reproductive biology is that there are now microchips that are available that have over 5,000 genes on them. And don't, don't be worried or nervous that you're going to be able to pick out your six foot nine basketball playing son or, or your uh, athletically inclined daughter or what have you, because if you don't possess those genes, there is no ability to insert the six foot nine basketball player gene into your gene pool at the present time. University of Pennsylvania had their hand, <coughs> wrist slapped a few years ago when they tried to do some gene insertion um, tech, uh, uh, experiments and they had some disastrous outcomes, so that was put on hold. But the microchip technology, you can identify over 5,000 different traits right now using this type of uh, uh, gene chip technology. It's still not available to the general public, but you can see where this is going in three to five years. Again, you'll be able to almost pick out the blue-eyed, blonde, et cetera, in the gene pool, whether it's present or not. I'll touch on another area that has been very, very, uh, It's a uh, tough subject to talk about when you have a uh, six-year-old with cancer or a 10-year-old and the parents know that there's a possibility that the treatments they're gonna have may end up saving their lives because our oncology co colleagues have gotten so good now at curing pediatric and adolescent cancers that these folks are living on into their adult lives to be productive members of society and they wanna have kids. So we established a program with St. Christopher Hospital where we are now able to take the reproductive tissues from the children and store them in the hopes that 10, 15, 20 years from now when they meet the right person and they want to perpetuate their gene lines on the planet, that they're going to be able to have that opportunity. It is very, very difficult to deal with these types of patients because most of the time, everybody's focused on them trying to stay alive. But the American College of Clinical Oncologists have realized that our specialty has become so adept at being able to freeze tissue that they have now made it a standard recommendation that a discussion must be held with a oncology patient to determine whether they are interested in having their reproductive tissues frozen for future use. Egg freezing, they've been freezing sperm for 50 plus years. I mean, if you want to go to a sperm bank, you can pick out Einstein's sperm if you want. I mean, it costs a lot of money, and I don't know why you want to have Einstein's sperm, but, but there is, that technology's been around for a long time. Egg freezing, however, has only been around since the mid-80s. 
And the reason is because the antifreezes that we use to freeze eggs would damage the eggs when you thawed them. So there was only about a 10% success rate of thawing an egg and then having it competent for fertilization. My embryologist, Dr. Scott Smith, who came from the number one IVF program in the United States down at, uh, uh, in Atlanta at that time, Reproductive Biology Associates, was the first guy in the United States to put freeze an egg, thaw it, put it with sperm, create an embryo, and mom had a live child. So he's our director of, uh, of uh, embryology laboratory. You can imagine that not only does egg freezing empower women to be able to protect their reproductive potential because of prospective um, uh, uh, cancer therapies that might sterilize them, but there are also folks coming to us who say, you know, I'm not really quite ready to have a family, I'm gonna go to law school or I'm going to uh, pursue my career until my mid-30s, and, and I want to be able to freeze down my eggs such that when I decide I'm going to have a family, that this social delay, if you will, gives me the opportunity. Because remember, men make darts till the day they die. Women are born with all they got. So once you reach menopause, you have now actually exhausted all of your oocytes. And unhealthy behaviors along the way, smoking and, uh, and uh, uh, unhealthy diets and what have you, and exposures to toxins, those, can, those things can all accelerate your, your uh, reproductive aging and, and increase the attrition of your oocytes. So protect your eggs, ladies, and don't engage in any kind of therapy or any kind of activities that will uh, that will uh, accelerate their loss because then you end up having to come to somebody like myself. But so the egg freezing has given an opportunity now for women to be proactive about freezing their eggs down in their 20s and early 30s to use them later on. Because remember, if you come back at the age of 40 and you thaw that egg and it was frozen when you were 28 years old, you will still have the success rate of a 28-year-old. And that's how those 65-year-old Italian ladies are getting pregnant. You know, it's a little crazy. But they, they, uh, the uterus doesn't age. If you give hormones and you make the uterus a receptive environment, you use an egg from a donor, put it with sperm, you make an embryo, then it can gladly check into the hotel room for nine months, no matter how old you are. It's a different story whether you should be doing that or not. All right. So there are also alternatives for folks who have lost their uh, ability to produce eggs. As I mentioned, you can adopt an egg from someone else. There are folks who've been through in vitro fertilization and have embryos that they don't want destroyed, so they will donate them to other couples. Some people don't qualify for traditional adoption because adoption is, can be rather expensive. There are age limits for people who are going through adoption. So we have embryos that people can look through the profiles and then place that embryo into a recipient. There's also gestational carrier. We have women who come to us who have lost their uterus through treatments for cancer or from trauma, or they have congenital problems. They were born without a uterus called rokitansky kuster hauser syndrome. Um, and so you can hire a stunt uterus to carry the pregnancy for you. And surrogacy, which is you, um, are inseminating someone else and then you, that woman gets pregnant and then you and your partner adopt that baby from them. Some of you may have heard of robotic surgery. Um, the Da Vinci system has been around for a few years now, but again, the, the revolutionary things that have occurred in the last few years in medicine are just mind boggling. When I went through my training at Duke in 89 to 93, and I participated in eight and 10 hour operations on women with cancer, they were horrific operations. You were split from stem to stern, and you would be out of, out of uh, commission for eight weeks at a time trying to recover from these big operations. Along came 
Da Vinci surgery. And Da Vinci surgery makes four little half inch incisions up here. And you have one incision down here. And the laparoscope is attached to robotic arms. And the surgeon sits at a console and doesn't even touch the patient and manipulates like a video game the instruments inside the patient. I can tell you that in, people oftentimes have this surgery go home the same day and they are back to work in three to four days. So again, incredible advances in surgery. And I can tell you that there's somebody sitting here in the audience who is a recipient of this surgery, and that's my mom. And she had this surgery, and she successfully beat uterine cancer. And a week later, we were at a Lehigh football game having a great time. So unthinkable 10 years ago to even have that. We are engaged in research. And somebody asked me, what is it like being a doctor? And I said, you know, it's not a job. It's a privilege to be a physician, to be able to help others in need. And every day, there are new challenges and new exciting things that happen. And research is one of those things that just keeps you running back every day. We just got a grant for $100,000 to study for those of you taking biology, you know that there are telomeres and chromosomes. And it turns out that telomere lengths are markers of aging. And nobody's ever thought about looking at that and correlate it with a woman's reproductive potential. So we got a big grant for that. We're also looking with the Department of Molecular Biology at Lehigh University. Um, they're the materials management folks there. I sit on two PhD committees there for students who are getting their PhDs in molecular biology. And over a coffee conversation, after a PhD defense, I was talking to one of the guys and he's telling me that he's doing research on these glass cover slips that have pores in them. And there's a guy at the materials science uh, department at Lehigh who can drill holes into these bioglass scaffoldings. And if you look at them, let me see if I can, uh, I'll show you a picture of this. You can see this is magnified scaffolding here. And here is a cell that is now bridging the gap between the pores here. So. What this technique allows cells to do, because normally when you grow cells on a plastic dish, they stay two-dimensional and cells aren't two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional. What glass scaffolding does is allow the cell to reacquire its three-dimensional structure. And you can imagine now the power of being able to recreate three-dimensional cellular structure in a dish, which was previously unheard of. This is now resulting in people at Brown University working on the artificial ovary, people working on artificial um, uterus. And this scaffolding technique that uh, they were using to grow artificial bone in, we got a grant to look at growing uterine cells in this. And this is actually a picture of the uterine cell bridging that uh, porous gap. One other really cool thing that we're looking at is the metabolic profile of an embryo in a dish. You know, when you look at embryos in a dish, you're, you're confronted with, well, which one is the winning horse? You know, they look good, they don't have, normally we look for fragmentation, we look for um, how the cells look, like the nice Olympic rings. Well, that's very subjective. So it's kind of like going to a car lot and you see a nice shiny car and you have a beat up jalopy next door to it, but you can't put the key in and turn it on to see where the engine works. The beat up car with a lot of scratches and dents may work better than the shiny fancy new car. So we are faced with this dilemma of how do you pick out healthy quality embryos? And what we have embarked on is a study where we look at the glucose uptake, amino acids, pyruvate, lactate production, and ammonia, and you can sample these from around each embryo and develop a profile based on this 
pregnancy rates appear to increase about 15% if you pick out the particular metabolic profiles that are um, associated with healthy outcomes. So ultimately, why do we do all this? Well, the reason we do all this is to have the healthy baby in your arms. And I want to point out that that Amy Weston here is also a North Penn graduate. She's the head of my nursing staff, and she was in the Marching Knights Band and uh, was in the Color Guard, and I promised her that I would give her a, a, a big uh, poke for North Penn, and she also had a fantastic experience here. I alluded to the fact that uh, I am an author, and I kind of fell into this. I had a phone call from a publishing company 12 years ago and said the fellow who was working on this book uh, has decided to not continue it. Would you be interested in doing this? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we are now working on the fourth edition of the board review for obstetrics and gynecology. And again, I can thank my English teachers here for giving me a vocabulary and a writing, uh, writing skills that have served me well throughout my career. So it's about 10 o'clock, and I know you guys have to get on, but um, I want to thank you so much for letting me uh, spend a few minutes with you and give you some insights. Thank you, Dr. Simkuti. It's not often that we have a practicing physician come in and talk to us about what's happening in research and in the medical field. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Samkuti with us here today. And what makes it all the better is it's not always that we have a North Penn graduate who can come in and talk to us about these topics. Two years ago, the gentleman who spoke to us was a, became a lawyer and argued cases before the Supreme Court. Last year, we had a gentleman who had graduated in the early 60s, and he had been involved in developing parts of the mechanical heart, the artificial heart, and he was in the pioneering stages of that. And here today, we have with us a gentleman who pioneers and is out there every day working on research in obstetrics and gynecology and advancing research in those areas so that, and hopefully none of you in here will need his services, but if you do, you know that locally we have folks who can handle those issues and those concerns for you. And we have folks who have graduated from North Penn High School who are in the vanguard of research and solving the problems and the issues that the world faces today. So, Dr. Samkuti, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your research. as well as the path that it took to get to that point. So at this point, I will dismiss everyone to fourth period. One more thing, whoops. I'm gonna say one more thing, that you guys were so well behaved. When we sat at these assemblies, it was out of control. The people were screaming and yelling and never, nobody listened to the person talking, so I commend you guys for your good behavior. Thank you.